So, all right, welcome everybody. This is the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. It's called Devotional Service on this particular one. We just finished the 11th chapter, the universal form of the Lord. And uh, it, it's funny how Krishna kind of summarizes each chapter almost. I mean, if you go back to each chapter, you can find where Krishna recommends Bhakti Yoga. He recommends devotional service uh, uh, to him as the highest and best form of yoga. So in the last chapter in 1154, he said, Bhakcha Aham 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 cha parantapa. And what he says here is that Bhakcha, by devotional service, Ananyaya, without being mixed with fruitive activities or speculative knowledge, Gyantum, uh, you will allow you to know Krishna, Drastum, to see Krishna, Tadvena, in truth, in fact, and Praveshtum Cha, to enter into. Uh, this this uh, love of Godhead, this devotional mood, and in this way you can enter into the mysteries of Krishna's understanding. So what happens here in this next uh, chapter is that Krishna then uh, carries forward and recommends all of the appropriate devotional uh, behaviors to Arjuna and so Arjuna starts the, the chapter 12 out uh, by making an inquiry. If you notice, Arjuna has accepted Krishna's spiritual master, and therefore he's inquiring intelligently from the spiritual master, his Lord Krishna, and Krishna is giving him, giving him all of this enlightenment. So he just showed Arjuna his universal form. Why? Because he was his dear friend, because he was not envious of Krishna. So therefore Krishna revealed himself. And after Arjuna saw the form, he begged Krishna's forgiveness because he had become familiar with Krishna, uh, lying on the same bed, talking, joking amongst friends, um, and so many different things that after he realized that he's the supreme personality of Godhead, param brahma, param dhamma, pavitram, paramam bhava. So Arjuna comes, comes forward and it explains uh, that he's asking for forgiveness because he's felt like he's offended the Lord. So in this chapter, we'll start in just a moment, but normally what we do is we have a little kirtan to start with, and uh, I think we'll do a little uh, invocation for Srila Prabhupada. Can, can everybody hear this okay here? Is this okay? Yes, perfect. Is that all right? Namo Vishnu Padayo Vishnu Pristayo Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. All right. So thank you very much. I hope everybody could hear that okay. It's a little weird chanting like that, to be honest with you, because you, I can't really hear you. So it's hard to feed off of what you're doing. But hey, it's a virtual reality here, right? <laughs> we're listening. We're here. You're there. We're good. All right. Well, so um, chapter 12. Yes. Susan, Susan's in the Bahamas. Right. Corey, Corey is in Canada. Okay. And Drew is working. I'm they just going to the Yes, that's right. What about Simon? Is he here? He's not here yet? No, I haven't heard from, from him. I've he sent him a earlier, message. So he, may, he may show up any minute. So there's only 20 verses in this short chapter, so we have plenty of time left for discussion. And so I'll start out by uh, reading um, the first uh few verses and then anybody who wants to jump in just unmute and grab a piece of this okay devotional service text one Arjuna inquired which are considered to be more perfect those who are always properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal Brahman the unmanifest so Arjuna is posing a question to Krishna Krishna answers very succinctly Supreme Personality of Godhead said, those who fix their minds on my personal form and are always engaged in worshiping me with great and transcendental faith are considered by me to be the most perfect. So is there any question left about that? <laughs> is Krishna I prefer to be worshiped in his impersonal feature as Brahman? Apparently not. Here he explains that he prefers um, uh, to be worshipped in his personal form. Now he goes on to say, but those who fully worship the unmanifested, that which lies beyond the perception of the senses, the all-pervading, inconceivable, unchanging, fixed, and immovable, the impersonal conception of the absolute truth, by controlling the various senses and being equally disposed to everyone, such persons engaged in the welfare of all at last achieve me. So it is possible through this uh, process of actually jnana yoga. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Jnana, you know, is knowledge or wisdom of God. And uh, to know God is to love God. So the more we then know about God's truth, the more we're actually going to fall in love with God. So therefore, in the end, even by the cultivation of all this knowledge, you can at last achieve Krishna. But it, he goes on to say, for those whose minds are attached to the unmanifest and personal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. And to make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. But we'll come back and revisit this verse uh, in just a moment and explain why it's so difficult. But those who worship me, giving up all their activities unto me and being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service and always meditating upon me, <coughs> having fixed their minds upon me, O son of Prita, for them I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. <coughs> so anybody? Would like to pick up from there? Text eight. Everybody got their Gita handy? We got anybody want to step up? You have to unmute, Rangavati. I think Denise said she couldn't read tonight. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, I just, I don't have a whole lot of insight because I haven't read ahead, but I uh -huh. will happy to read as many verses as anybody wants me to yeah, just, just <laughs> okay. you could read four or five verses for us i think that'd be fabulous just sure. all right text eight yeah. just fix your mind upon me the supreme personality of godhead and engage all your intelligence in me thus you will live in me always without a doubt text nine my dear arjuna a winner of wealth 
If you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, then follow the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. In this way, develop a desire to attain me. <laughs> Text 10. If you cannot practice the regulations of bhakti yoga, then just try to work for me. Because by working for me, you will come to the perfect stage. stage. And text 11. If, however, you are unable to work in this consciousness of me, then try to act giving up all results of your work and try to be self-situated. Go ahead and read one more, if you will. Oh, sure. Text 12. If you cannot take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation. And better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. For by such renunciation, one can attain peace of mind. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else want to grab a few? Rangavati, Jack Krishna, you, or you got your data handy? If not, uh, no, I don't. I'm, I'm on my phone and I'm not home. So oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just tuned in. But next week, I'll, I'll have my tablet with me. Okay, not not a problem. How about Bhavananda? He's always, uh, where's that hand, Bhavananda? There it is. Okay. Yeah, could you read a few? Text 13, 14. He's trying to un unmute. Oh. There we go. Okay. Uh, 13. One who is not envious, but is kind, is a kind friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination. His mind and intelligence fixed on me. Such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. He by whom one is put into difficulty and who is not disturbed by anyone, who is equal, equal, compo, equal, equal posed in happiness and distress, fear and anxiety, is very dear to me. My devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities who is pure, expert, without cares, free from all pains, and not striving for some result is very dear to me. Okay. Want to keep going? Uh, yeah, well, we, we're down to the last three verses. How about Rangavati? Would you, would you mind reading those for us? Okay, okay. One who neither rejoices nor grieves, who neither laments nor desires, and who renounces both auspicious and inauspicious things, such a devotee is very dear to me. One who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equal poised in honour and dishonour, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, who is always free from contaminating association, always silent and satisfied with anything, who doesn't care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge and who is engaged in devotional service. Such a person is very dear to me. Those who follow this imperishable path of devotional service and who completely engage themselves with faith, making me the supreme goal, are very dear to me. Very, very dear to me. He said it twice. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent guys that's that is that chapter that's one of the shortest chapters in the Gita actually we just finished one of the longer chapters in the Gita last time so we were we were over about 18 minutes last time now we're going to have the luxury of discussing pure devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead so it starts out like this guys and I've got a couple of comments to make and please chime in anytime you have a question or comment or whatever you want <clears throat> but in text 18 to 19, Krishna explains that one has to be equipoised, you know, in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness, distress, fame and infamy. So that's a tall order for a person who is identifying with the material body. 
because the material body is uh, the intelligent, the false ego, the mind, right? Uh, the intelligence, the mind, and the senses, right? So the senses are always demanding something. It doesn't matter what it is. They're always demanding something. And so the senses have to be brought back in with the self, within the self, controlled by the intelligence. Krishna recommends that over and over again. He also says, Matra sparsas to kontaya satosna sukadukada. What that means is, is that one uh, should be uh, transcendental, really, to the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress, their disappearance in due course of time, the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. Uh, they are due to sense perception, right? Sense perception. And one has to learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. We've all been around people who just the littlest thing can upset their peace. Uh, just the littlest, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, they're always complaining about something that's not just perfect in the world for them uh, as far as their senses, their material body goes. So here Krishna is very carefully explaining uh, that, you know, if you want to become dear to him, you do need to get over uh, all of this distress, this happiness and distress in the material world. These things are being taken place by the material nature, the three modes of material nature. Even though we think we're the doer, we are not the actual doer. Uh, our situation is, is these modes are, are being done and they're carrying out the results of our karmic reaction. We learned that in the previous chapters. So the body is conducting all these different activities. Everything is going, the food is digesting, we're evacuating, you know, we're seeing, we're breathing, we're hearing, we think. Everything is going on. We don't know how. Scientists are trying to figure it out. And just in the last hundred years, have they made any progress being able to understand how the material body even works or the material world for that matter? So this is a very complex machine called a Virata Rupa that Krishna has made for us, which is a replica of the spiritual world. It actually is a shadow of the spiritual world. And things here look real, but they're not. They're temporary. So Krishna is recommending, do not partake in those pleasures which are temporary. The wise man does not partake in those pleasures knowing that they're temporary. And instead, he concentrates on his eternal benefit or spiritual life. This material body is a sturdy boat for us to cross over this ocean of nescience. And with the spiritual master at the helm guiding the boat, we can easily attain our desired destination. In this chapter, in a couple of the purports, Prabhupada explains that for the yogi, who's adept at yoga, he can transfer his soul at will to any planet. So if he wants to go to a higher planetary system, live a longer life, have greater pleasure, this or that, he can go. But why would you want to? Krishna says earlier in Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma Bhuvanaloka. Uh, that means that this world is a place of mrityu. This world is a place of death. Even from Brahma Loka all the way down to the lowest planet. All are places of misery where in repeated birth and death take place. So the wise does not engage in those activities. Instead, the wise follows Krishna's instructions in 3 9, in chapter 3, number 9. He said, Yogyarta karma no nyatra, loko yam karma bandana, tadartam karma kontaya, mukta sangha samatara. In other words, if you don't work, for Vishnu, if you don't work for Krishna, you're guaranteed to be bound up in a wheel of samsara, cycle of birth and death, repeated. Prabhupada said you've been embodied since time immemorial. So it's hard for us to imagine uh, being unembodied. Very difficult for us to imagine being unembodied. So in the very first verse, let's go back to the beginning and I'll, I'll show you what Krishna is explaining here when we look at, um, uh, okay, so this is very interesting, text three and four. 
he 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 kind of gives in a little bit to the impersonal aspect because that is a feature of Krishna, you know, the light of God's body, the Brahma Jyoti, all of that's real. So he says, but those who fully worship the unmanifested, that which lies beyond the perception of the senses. So let me ask you guys a question. When's the last time you had an experience of anything that really lies beyond the perception of the senses? <laughs> This is how we gather our knowledge. The mind and the, the five senses like that uh, are working senses to gather information. And they're imperfect, right? So therefore, the knowledge that we gather through these senses is also imperfect, right? So therefore, we're fallible. And anyone who is dependent on knowledge that they gather through their senses is fallible. Okay? And it doesn't matter if it's scientists or if it's the government or it doesn't matter if it's the military generals. <laughs> they can't protect you. There's no way that they're going to be able to protect you. They, have, they don't have perfect knowledge. They don't understand how all these things are working. They don't. Because they're bound up in a web of illusion created by mental speculation and mental concoction. Think about it. People concoct all kinds of nonsense in this world trying to extract pleasure from the material world. And sometimes it can go very wrong. You, you know what I'm saying? And it's always binding us in karmic retribution. So people, you know, they feel unfairly picked upon. Why me, Lord? Right? We've heard that in our lives. Why me, Lord? Well, because it's your karma. So, yagyarta karma no nyatra, loko yam karma bandana, karma bandana. You're bound up in a web of karma. How do you get out? How do you get out? Work for Krishna. And Krishna is going to recommend in this chapter some ways for you to get out. And we'll get to those in just a second. But here's the problem. For those, and by the way, <clears throat> there's really kind of only two schools, right? In personalism, personalism, pretty much atheism after that, avoidism. You know, we know that, that, that those things are the spiritual master is trying to um, uh, fight in the world. He's trying to bring people to the personal aspect of Krishna. So when we go to the temple and we see the deity standing on the altar, Radha Krishna or, or Nittai Gauru Chandra, or Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, or Nishringadev. Uh, you know, when we see the Lord in his personal aspect, it's not an idol. It's not a material thing. It may be made of marble. It may be made of brass. There may be oil paint. It may be some whatever it is. But those things are now fully converted to the transcendental strata because they're being used fully in the service of the Lord. Now, i got something for you that's going to blow your mind. When you're engaged in devotional service to the Lord, Prabhupada said that when your activities, where you go, you offer your food to the Lord, you go to the store, you buy boga for the Lord, you work for the Lord, you give some result to the work, you read the books, you study what the spiritual master is recommending, you're trying your best to follow it, you're chanting God's holy names. Guess what? If you can do that nonstop throughout the day, that's called samadhi. Prabhupada said you are in samadhi. You're no longer in the material world because the contribution and the, the actual sacrifice burns up to ashes any karmic retribution that you might experience. So you're not going to get karma for that. And what does that do that liberates you back to the spiritual world? There's no... Uh, good karma or bad karma here for you to come back to. So therefore, you're in a position of transcendence and you want to pass from this world in that mindset, remembering Krishna. So uh, he says that this advancement in this is troublesome and to make discipline in the impersonal aspect is very difficult. So why would we want to take a very difficult path? Why would we want to do that when we have actually the elevator right back home back to Godhead right I mean we really have an elevator and that elevator all we got to do is 
press that button of Krishna consciousness, climb on the elevator, and we're transcended back home, back to Godhead. Because the activities that we're performing are no longer material. Isn't that cool? And we develop divine qualities simply by associating with Vaishnavas, the deities, the holy name, the Shastra, Prashadam. All of these things are there to deliver us back home, back to Godhead, freedom from repeated cycle of birth and death, old age and disease, and misery in the material world. You know, I, I, I'm living out in the country right now, and I look outside, and I see all these creatures, and I think, wow, this is so beautiful. We're developing a thing called the Duck River Preserve, where you go out there, and there's deer everywhere. There's turkey walking around. There's owls. Uh, there are bobcats. Out, I mean, it's just beautiful. Raccoons and every kind of thing, and they just come up. They don't even know what people are. They haven't seen people. The farm's not been occupied for 100 years. I mean, as far as being developed. We're developing it now but just as much as we need to, uh, to host programs. But every one of those little beautiful creatures, the little rabbits, you know, uh, they, they stop and their ears are doing like this. They're very, very attentive. But why? Because their life is in danger and they know it. We're in the same danger they're in but we're oblivious to it and we don't acknowledge it and don't recognize that and we don't use it as an impetus to bring us into this devotional mindset of preparing ourselves to meet Krishna at the time of our death. You're guaranteed to die. Guaranteed. How many guarantees do you get in this life? Honestly, think about it. When's the last time you got a guarantee that really amounted to anything? <laughs> In the material world. I think I'm, I'm guaranteed to win that lottery tonight. <laughs> yeah, right. 900 million, you that's and, my... You and six quadrillion other people are, are dreaming a dream, girl. <laughs> you can be guaranteed to go back home, back to Godhead by the words of Krishna in this chapter. And not only does he guarantee it in this chapter, but Krishna is so kind that he does a kind of a synopsis with Arjuna on almost every chapter. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? He winds it up. Back in chapter three, uh, Krishna said, Yagya sastin ana santo, muchante sarva kil beside, bunjate te tvagam papas, ye panchat ma karananat. Hmm, hadn't read this one in a while. Uh, the devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sins because they eat food which is offered first for sacrifice. Others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. So Krishna is laying out the methodologies for us to get back home. And one of them is simply realize that, listen, the sun, the moon, the earth, the water, the light, the, the seeds, the plants, all of these things are provided by Krishna in unlimited varieties to, uh, to love you, to show love to you. He's serving you. He's giving you everything. So why wouldn't we give a little bit back, right? Right? So uh, this is the one I wanted to read to you earlier because, because we think we're doing it all. There is no God. There is no uh, uh, higher power. There is no actual intelligence to all of this. It just... I don't know. It just, there was an explosion. There was a chemical explosion somewhere in the universe. And now everybody's wearing a Rolex and driving a nice car, right? That's how that happens, right? Or there's some chunk of rock or some primordial soup, protoplasmic crud. And all of a sudden, some random lightning bolt hits it. This is their explanation. So would you give your soul to those people? or to a nation of fallible politicians, or to a government uh, of dictators who are out to exploit the citizens? No. So Ram Chandra, Sri Krishna, they come again and again to set the example of what the ideal nobility of a king, monarch, should be like. Krishna is actually the monarch in all species, he says. 
So we need to study the Shastras because by studying the Shastras, we can understand what is right and what is wrong, what is correct and what is incorrect, what is appropriate behavior, what is inappropriate behavior, what is absolute truth, what is relative truth. All of these things we need to know because by knowing these things, we realize our precarious predicament within this material world and we uh, can avoid uh, certain ruination by independent activities against the will of the Lord. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasaha. So the bewildered spirit soul under the influence of the three modes of material nature, he thinks that he's the doer. He thinks he's in control. He's perfectly powerful. He's happy. He's the master of his life, of his future. Uh, he is out to set up the most comfortable environment where he can be the happiest of all. And he doesn't want anyone to disturb it. He'll defend it at all costs. He'll work like an animal to get those monies, to enjoy that sense gratification. This is what's going on in the material world. Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. There it is. All the bugs are doing it. The fish are doing it. The mammals are doing it. The trees, the plants are even doing it. They emit lectins. <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> I found this out. They emit a poison so that when creatures come up to eat it, they, it makes them sick. They don't want it. They don't want to come back to it. So there's intelligence in every atom. Those things are spinning around faster than we can imagine. And there's all these different little particles that are beyond our sight, just like the soul is beyond our comprehension, our understanding. And the unmanifest part of Krishna is also beyond our understanding. It's beyond our sensual perception. How are you going to understand Krishna as the un unmanifest? Tell me. I mean, I could understand easily how, how these people could become bewildered. So the big problem with getting on the path of impersonalism is that you become kind of indoctrinated to impersonalism. And you want, it's hard to give it up. It's just like anything that you learn, any habit, any addiction, anything that you like or want in this material world, um, it's hard to give it up. So therefore you must have a higher taste, right? And what does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita about that? He says, although one may give up the objects of the senses, the desire for the sense objects remains. <laughs> so what to do? Krishna says, but by experiencing a higher taste, by experiencing a higher taste, he's able to give up these things that are not uh, uh, good for his spiritual advancement. So here's the point. If we're not getting a higher taste, if we're not receiving the higher taste, then we just have to go at it stronger. We have to work at it harder. But we can't give up. It's like, you know, one time I got a, a job when I was a young man. The guy said, I got to have all this done. I said, man, it looks impossible. He said, just do a little at a time. So a few weeks later, the guy comes back. Things all fixed. He's like, wow, you did it. So we just got to take it a little bite at a time. You know, Christians say one day at a time. So you may have a bad day today, but you have a better day tomorrow. You can always start from here. You don't have to worry about what you've done in the past. Krishna actually says, Prabhupada says that Krishna handles all that for you. When you take up devotional life, your previous karma is being dealt with by Krishna personally when you take up devotional service. So that's not that you should sit and worry and fret over those things. This is what he says. Indriyan yarte rajar devesh avya. I can't read this one. It's too small. I've got it written down too small. But attraction and repulsion for sense objects are felt by the embodied being. But one should not fall under control of the senses and sense objects because they are stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. I apologize for that. I wrote this down. It's so small, I can't see it <laughs> when I didn't have memorized. 
But I thought that was a good verse for this purpose today. So, uh, um, so the basic idea is if we go back through the chapters previously, we'll see that Krishna recommends that whatever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one should bring it back under the control of the self. Yato yato nishchalati manaschanchalam atritam ashitam. So we need to bring our minds back to Krishna, wherever they go from, wherever they wander from. We have to practice every moment. You're given a brand new opportunity every single moment, every second you're being given an opportunity to choose Krishna. Right? Every second you're being given an opportunity to address your decision of how you want to go forward. What, are, what decisions will you make? How will that affect your spiritual health? Right? How will that affect your, your you know, affect your spiritual life? Uh, because you're being given these moment by moment decisions. And by the way, at the time of death, all those decisions that you made will pass before your eyes. And that's what you'll be conscious of. You can't cheat Krishna. You can't say, oh, well, I'm going to do all nonsense for my whole life. And at the very last moment, I'll remember Krishna's not proper. Good luck. That's why we chant Hare Krishna. That's why we take prasadam. That's why we see everything in association with Krishna. It's called Krishna consciousness, to become conscious of Krishna. And Krishna says, after many, many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto him, knowing him to be the cause of all causes and all that be. Bahonam jamanam ante, yanavam mam prabhadyante, vasudeva sarvamiti. Prabhupada uses that a lot. Vasudeva sarvamiti. Krishna is the cause of everything. Asa mahatma sadulava. So the mahatmas realize that Krishna is the source of everything. Whatever you think you like, whatever you think you enjoy, whatever stimulates your mind, that is a spark of Krishna's splendor. So I'm sitting over here and I've got a million dollars right here, right now. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. You can take $1 or you can take $999,000. Okay. Which one did you want? Right. You're not going to take the $1. You're going to take the $999,000. So why not take it all? Why not go all the way? <laughs> Why not get all Krishna? Get everything Krishna has for you. You are heir to that kingdom of God. You're a son or daughter of God. You're a child of God. Krishna wants you back. And he's given you instructions on how to come home. And so this chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, Nasteva, Gatira Tata. So in this age, the Yuga Dharma, the religion of the age, is to call out the name of God and try to do it as a small child begging for the mother or someone in an ocean that has no way out unless someone gives the rope. This is our predicament. Krishna is the only source of your actual salvation. Now, the guru brings you Krishna. So he is the transcendental uh, via medium to the spiritual sky. So, uh, so this concept of after many, many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders to Krishna. So that's why we study the Shastra. That's why we want to develop this knowledge of God, because it makes us love God. You know, every day you can be completely fascinated <clears throat> and surcharged with this feeling of love and devotion, which is a very, very happy, blissful lifestyle. There's no need. <clears throat> for depression. There's no need for unhappiness in the material world. Prabhupada used to say, chant and be happy. Sounds simple? It works. Why? Because you're associating with the happiest personality, Krishna. Right? 
If you associate with thieves, you'll be a thief. If you associate with Krishna, you'll become holy. You'll become, you'll develop divine characters, so, characteristics. So whatever it is that you see in your life that is your particular issue or problem, we all have, everybody has got stumbling blocks on the path back home, back to Godhead, because we've been in the material body. We've become addicted to the material body. We've become addicted to the material senses. And therefore, those things have become our God. Literally, they've become our idol. Money has become someone's idol, for an example. Prestige may be another man's idol. Fame may be an addiction for somebody else that drives them completely crazy. We've seen these stories. We see, especially in Nashville, where I live. A lot of stories of disastrous people who came here seeking fame, ended up dead, or, uh, you know, God knows what, right? So fame will never make you happy. Uh, adoration, distinction will never make you happy. If the spiritual master receives the disciples worship and relishes it and enjoys it for his own purpose, it's boga. He can't do that. He has to give it up to some pradaya. He has to understand this is not for me. This is for Krishna. So in the same way, everything that we see here, it all belongs to Krishna. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. Krishna has allowed us to use that to test us, literally, to see what we're going to do. Are we ready to come back home, back to Godhead? Or do we need to stay in the material world a little longer? Right? Because if there's anything here you want, Krishna loves you enough to be sure you get it. And he'll give you the perfect body to receive it. And guess what? You'll think that body's the best thing that ever happened. You remember the story of Indra. So, you know, where he was a, 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 a hog in stool, it wouldn't leave to go back to the, to the throne of heaven, it wouldn't go back. So you see any of this spark of Krishna's splendor, don't become enamored by, by that or obsessed by that. Instead, become enamored by the holy name, become enamored by the qualities of Krishna, become enamored by his beauty, become enamored by his adventures and activities which are fabulous to hear about. Matter of fact, when we finished the Bhagavad Gita series, I was talking to Pran Pra, my god brother today. When we finish this Bhagavad Gita series, um, I think what we're going to do is try to grab some stories out of Srimad Bhagavatam and just take select stories because the adventures of Krishna, they thrill our minds and souls, right? And we want to hear these stories about Krishna. It's easy to fall in love with someone like Krishna. He's the most beautiful. He's the most adventurous. He's the most heroic. Everything you want from a movie star. Spider-Man ain't giving it to you. <laughs> Spider-Man ain't got it. The Hulk can't do it. You see what they do is they take all these uh, parts of Krishna's abilities and they create these superheroes that have one quality each. <laughs> of course, Superman had all the qualities, right? <laughs> but he could still be killed by kryptonite. So he had an Achilles heel, didn't he? So we turn to Krishna for our protection. So Krishna says, Yat karosi yarashnasi, yat juhosi tadasiyat. O son of Kunti, all that you do, all that you offer, all that you give away, as well as all austerities that you may perform, they should all be done as an offering to me, and they will liberate you. And we think, well, we don't like austerity. Hey, I got people that live all around me. They're up earlier than I am. They're up at 3.30 going to work to drive a, some kind of diesel truck or operate heavy equipment in the hot sun all day or in the freezing cold. Is that austerity? So yogis used to bathe in the, in the rivers, like the Ganges River, and it's very cold. They'd be up to their neck like that. Uh, and they're accepting austerity to deny the body. Isn't that interesting? To deny the material body and deny the senses uh, of their objects so that they can become peaceful and fixed. Anything you want. When Arjuna finished, he said, what is it, Krishna, that causes a man, even of intelligence and discrimination, who's trying his best to do something good in this world, how is he being carried away as cloud-riven? 
by the wind. And Krishna says, Arjuna, it is lust only. And it's the all-devouring enemy of mankind. And one must defeat it at all costs. So this is our charge. This is what we're charged with. And by the way, lust can never satisfy. It's like a fire. You want the fire to go out. You have to quit putting logs on it. Right? If you want the fire to go out, you have to quit putting logs on it. Otherwise, you're just flaming it up, flaming it up, flaming it up, flaming it up. And you're, you're becoming absorbed in, in maya by going for that. But Krishna recommends something completely different. And so in each chapter, he gives us good advice. And for an example, in the ninth chapter, which we did not too long ago, uh, Krishna says, Manmana bhava madbhakto majjaji nam namaskaru. Mami vaisheshi yukvayvam. Atmanam matparayana. Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Okay, can it be more simple? Is there something else that we needed to know? Manmana baba mad bhakto. Engage your mind always in thinking of me in devotion. Offer your obeisances. Worship me. Being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. So in this chapter, Krishna also says that uh, at the end of the chapter where we just read, he says, um, those who follow this imperishable path of devotional service and who completely engage themselves with faith, making me the supreme goal, are very, very dear to me. They're very dear. He goes on to say all of these different things that make you very, very dear. And one of them is to realize the very first precept of spiritual life and realization, the Tato Brahma Jigasa, is to know that I am not the body. I am the spirit soul. So if you're actually the soul, this body, this body is going to be dirt. It's going to be dust. It's going to be stool. It's not going to be anything you want to deal with. Yet we're making it up, making it very beautiful right now. We think it's very important. It is important because it's a tool for self-realization, but it's also a tool for personal degradation, and it will lock us into karmic retribution for time immemorial. It has, and it will. So it's time to get out of that labyrinth, and so Krishna explains that my devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities, who is pure, expert, and not striving for some kind of material result in a material world, selfish material gain. That person is very, very dear to Krishna. And by him who no one is put into any difficulty, and who is not being disturbed by anyone. How do you do that? How do you not be disturbed by other people? Think about that a minute. What's the way to do that? All right, anything that you're attached to will be the cause of your suffering. Anything. None of it belongs to you. It was here before you got here. It'll be here when you're gone. You're being given it to be to you so Krishna can check you out in this human form of life to see where you need to go next. Right? So, so the point is, is that if you're not putting anybody in, you're not disturbing anybody, you're equipoised in happiness, distress. You don't have fear. You don't have anxiety. It may come as waves. It's like Krishna said, let all these things come like rivers going into the ocean, which is ever still, but always being filled, right? So Krishna talks about that in Bhagavad Gita. So these things may come. Yo, I feel a little happy. I feel a little distressed. I feel a little this, feel a little that. My body's hurting today. Rangavati's got allergies. Got to go to the doctor tomorrow. Suffering today. Had to stay back. So the body's there. But if you concentrate on Krishna, you'll forget about the body. You'll forget about those pains. You'll experience a higher pleasure. Could you imagine Jesus Christ hanging on a cross and then sticking him with swords and feeding him vinegar and putting a crown of thorns and his hands are filled with... Come on, man. But he was absorbed in samadhi, constantly thinking about his Father in heaven. 
So my devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities. Okay, the ordinary course of activities means what's going on in the material world. We don't depend on that. We depend on Krishna. Krishna can do anything. If Krishna wants to open a temple in your town, he'll send you a million dollars to do it. But you've got to get out there and you've got to do the job of talking to people and find that person. It may take some time. Who knows? It may take a minute. But I understood that we have 54 active temples in the United States of America. So somebody did the work. And we just got to keep doing it, man. Keep doing it, keep doing it. And by the way, success is in the moment that you're doing it. It's not the result. You're not striving for some result. Your, your, your goal is to love God. Your goal is to remember God. Your goal is to give everything to God. Whether you're successful or a failure, that's up to God. And if you're preaching to people and talking to people and trying to give them this information, they're not taking it up. Guess what? Not your business. That's between Krishna and the spiritual master in that soul. Not you. You've done your job. You've tried to give a little information. You've encouraged. You're literally begging people to take this spiritual life up. But people have free will. and They can do whatever they want to. So that's the issue. So let's go back here uh, to the verse. Uh, let's see. Mm. Okay. So uh, this would be text six and seven. So Krishna does explain, but those who worship me giving up all their activities in the being and being devoted without deviation, engaged in devotional service, meditating on me, fix their minds on me. For them, I'm the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. That's a big deal. It's a very, very, very big deal. So then he says, just fix your mind on me. Engage all your intelligence in me. Thus you will live me without a doubt. So I'm going to recommend to everyone, everywhere for the rest of my life, read chapter 12, devotional service, at least three times a day for the rest of your life. Because this chapter is a chapter that you can understand exactly what Krishna wants from you. It's coming from the mouth of God directly into your ear, orally being received from Sanjaya and Dhritarashtra's conversation between Arjuna and Krishna, which was heard on the battlefield, recorded, and carried down 5,000 years ago to you today. And you're here. And if many, many, many millions of men, one may seek the truth. And out of many, many, many millions of men who seek the truth, only one may find me in truth. You're here to find God in truth. You're a very blessed soul. And anyone who ever hears this, this conversation uh, that we're having today about Krishna can become liberated from this material world just as Krishna is directing Arjuna 5,000 years ago. It's pertinent today. It works today. This process uh, is a process that anyone can follow as long as they can chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. It's all that's required. If you look at the life of Haridas Thakur, uh, one of our greatest of all in our, our Sampradaya, Haridas Thakur didn't do anything but chant. So he filled up his life with the sound of God's name, and his life was perfected. So in our lives, whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever we offer, whatever we give away, we do as a sacrifice. You are a walking sacrifice. God owns you lock, stock, and barrel. He is the life of your life. He's the soul of your very soul. God loves you more than you love yourself. You don't understand the love of God. So you have to practice sadhana bhakti, right? So Krishna says, if you cannot fix your mind on me without deviation. So Krishna is making some concessions for rascals like, uh, like me. If you can't fix your mind without deviation in the principles or regular the principles of bhakti yoga, then what do you do? You just, you, you, you got to try then to follow the uh, regular principle of bhakti yoga. In this way, you can develop a desire to attain me. So when people go to the temple and they see the deities, they become more attractive. They taste the prasad and become more attractive. Develop friendships with the Vaishnavas to become more attractive. 
listen to the nice kirtan, the music, they become more attractive, right? Finally, they read some Shastra, and all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and go, you know what? Krishna is the person I've been looking for for all these trillions of lives. And I didn't know it. Now I know it. Now I'm resolved in purpose to get out and do something about my spiritual health. Okay? So that's what this is. And Krishna is explaining how you can gradually progress. So he says, if, however, you're unable to, uh, to do this, if you can't practice the regulations of Bhakti Yoga, then just work for Krishna. Because by working for me, you'll come to a perfect stage. If, however, you're unable to work in this consciousness of me, then just try to act giving up some results of your work and try to be self-situated. So that means to give in charity. And Prabhupada said that for people who can't take up Krishna consciousness now, they should still give in charity. They should give the results of their work. That sacrifice for others uh, is also required. If you can't take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation, and better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. For by renunciation, one can attain peace of mind. And how can there be any happiness without peace? Right? Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. So um, that's the story. We've got our marching orders. We've got our instructions. I think it's clear. But there may be a question or some comment or some elucidation that you would like to share. And I, I would like to hear it if there is one. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any comment, question? Uh, we're, we're running over our time. Uh, Rangavati, you're not unmuted. I was thinking probably my favorite verse is six to seven. Because it's so, it just tells you that's all you need to know. You haven't got to read the rest of the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> you just worship me, give up, give all your activities unto me. So act always by serving me in my interest and not your own. Be devoted to me without deviation. So just love him. Engage in devotional service and always meditate on me. It's always thinking of him. And fix your mind upon him. So obviously that's the way. And then I'm the swift deliverer of ocean of birth and death. So he'll take us straight back home. It <laughs> it's very simple. It's pretty simple stuff. <laughs> simple it's stuff. actually extremely simple, but we try to make it complex because we're mental speculators primarily. I mean, we are mental concoctors. We've been creating this illusion that we're living in life after life in all various species of life. And we're trying to raise a family every time. We're trying to have a nice sex life. We're trying to have nice food, nice place to live. And that's all we get. And then the karma that comes with that to give us another body. <clears throat> that's all we get. So, you know, if this is everything and this is all you need, then, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is not for you. But if you see that the soul is the actual spark, the battery within the body, the actual battery within the light bulb, if you see that, you know what I mean? That's what you need to concentrate your time and your energy on. And Krishna has given us very clear instructions here how to become his devotee. And he, he guarantees that that out of compassion for them, I dwelling in their hearts will destroy with a shining lamp of knowledge the darkness that was born of ignorance. So all you have to do is turn to Krishna, chant Hare Krishna, and whether you're doing it perfectly or imperfectly or you're doing it with all material desire or no material desire, whatever it is you're doing, turn to Krishna for it because everything came from Krishna. There's nothing that you see, touch, smell, taste, Nothing that is not Krishna. All right? Krishna says that. Aham Sarvasya Prabhupada. Krishna is the source of all uh, living and, and, and moving and non-moving, living, non-moving uh, creatures in the world. So we turn to Krishna for everything. And uh, we can be happy in this life. And we can go back home 
back to Godhead at the end of this life. And um, I think that's the story. And I think we're sticking to it. <laughs> so I hope uh, everybody had a good time on this class tonight. It is 8.08. And I promised I would try to finish on time. We did start a couple minutes late, so I, I went ahead and did that. But uh, if you... Uh, if you want to, you can go back to the YouTube channel, Bhakti Yoga Tennessee, and you can rehear this. And if you have any questions, you can email Gayatri Dasa at gmail.com, D A S A, or you can reach out to Bhakti Yoga Tennessee through our Facebook page or whatever you need, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions and happy to encourage you in devotional life and give you association. If you come and see us, we'll feed you Prashad or Bhavananda will, I should say, right, Bhavananda? There's the hand. All right. <laughs> I've got a message. Hang on before you go. Denise had to leave, but she just said, um, oh, she said that Zoom kicked and kicked her out of the meeting and I can't get back in. I did want to say that I like how Krishna gives devotees many options on what they can do to become closer. That is very much in line with today's diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion. Not everyone can do everything, but everyone can do something in the spirit of Krishna consciousness. That's beautiful. It's nice. Is that Denise? Yeah, Denise. Yeah, well, she couldn't get back in. She sent her back a very nice thing that, that we very much appreciate her observation. <laughs> All right. So, guys, that's it for tonight. If there's nothing else, I got to sign off to do my duty. I, I, I'm trying to keep this to one hour, and I, I could just go all night. I'm having a good time, and I don't want to do you like that. So, I, with your permission and your blessings, I am going to discontinue this call and end the recording at this time. And I want to thank you all. Please accept my respects. I'm so grateful to you to be here, and whoever hears this in the future, uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Jai Prabhu's Hare Krishna.